It's the Locked On Flyers podcast for Wednesday, November 27th, your daily dose of Flyers news, analysis, and high quality content that's taking a look at some potentially underperforming forwards. It's going to take a hard look. You're Locked On Flyers, your daily podcast on the Philadelphia Flyers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, and thanks for making Lockdown Flyers your first listen every day. I am Rachel Donner. I've been podcasting about the Flyers, the NHL, and hockey for a decade. I'm here with prospect expert and Flyers credentialed reporter for 19 years, Russ Cohen. You can start the season with a big return on FanDuel. New customers can place a $5 bet. You'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. And to keep up with our latest episodes and Flyers news, you can find us at Locked On Flyers on all your favorite socials, including Blue Sky. And of course, here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, we are going to get to previewing tonight's matchup against the Nashville Predators, who are their own puzzle oh, <laughs> outside yeah. of the Flyers. Plus, we have your mailbag questions coming up. So lots of good stuff today. But as far as the Flyers underperforming forwards. Right now, I think we're kind of looking at Tyson Forrester, Joel Farabee, and Owen Tippett, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, these are the three big underperforming guys that really made a difference last year and at this point of the season have not brought it at all. Yeah, it's interesting. So comparing their productivity this season to where they were last season at exactly this point. And very interestingly, they all had the same number of games played at this point where Owen Tippett and Joel Farabee were at 22 games played and Tyson Forrester was at one at game last mm-hmm. at 21 games played. So it's the same number of games per exact player, right? Apples to apples, at, yeah. Yeah, apples to apples here. So it is really interesting because so Tyson Forster last season at this point, five points this season, six points, right? So not a huge jump forward, except for the fact that this year, more of the points are goals. So he, he right. has four goals where he only had one goal at this point last season. Joel Farabee last year at this point was at 15 points this year, eight. Uh, he had eight goals last year at this point, three this year so far. And the guy with the closest point, uh, I think, you know, when you're looking at the grand scheme of things, uh, Owen Tippett had 11, um, excuse me, had 14 points last season at this point, seven goals, seven assists this year, 11 points. So three fewer points and you just subtract them from goals, right? Same number of assists. And he's getting more than two minutes a game, Tippett, more than last year on average. Yes. Right. And, you know, it, interestingly, of these three this year, Joel Farabee is getting the least amount of ice time at just yeah. under 15 minutes. Tyson Forster is just over 15 minutes. Yeah. So like somebody might say, hey, don't don't be so bad about Forster. He's got more goals. OK, but like based on what he did last year, he shouldn't be even close to the number. He total number it doesn't have to always be goals point number of last year because he should have taken a step forward and he hasn't. That's the problem with Tyson Forster. I still think it it, it, it affects his footwork. And I also think uh, something you have put here that uh, for the number of unblocked shots that missed the net, 37%. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is a high number. And he's the, the only- worst forward on the team. In that yeah. stat. And I, um, I'll let you guess who's, Second worst, but we'll continue. <laughs> no, but the thing is, you can let the viewers guess. I peaked already. Um, but the thing is, with with Forrest, Forrester, so I get that he's younger. Like, that's fine. But I think the problem is sometimes he's rushing his shots, and sometimes he is just not doing anything else but what he normally does. And if it hits, it hits, and if it misses, it misses. I still think he and Tippett especially – should employ more shot deception. Like I said, I brought up Michkov, I brought up Austin Matthews, guys like that who really know how to use the shot deception, and then that's how you create extra space instead of rushing a shot or just shooting it to shoot it or, you know, missing it off the rush. Right. And Forster's and I think, missed him off the rush. Like, he, we've seen him down low. Just right. Missed. 
Right. I think that's what's key with Forster, I think is exactly spot on, is that we saw him score a lot on the rush or create plays on the rush, even if it wasn't him that eventually got the goal. And uh, he's just not as good in a set offense, right? right? Because he can't find that open space. He's not as creative right. as some of the other guys on the team. And so he really has to capitalize on those rush opportunities. And he has it. And I think that you know, while his shooting percentage is, I think, artificially high because he's not taking a lot of quality shots. Right. For all, um, I do think that they have to figure out a combination that works for him, that he's going to have some success on the rush. And, you know, he's been on a line with Matt Vey Mitchkoff a, a little bit. Mitchkoff's the playmaker there. So Tyson Forster is not going to be able to rush down the ice with the puck. Right. On a line with Mitch Kopp, right? No, that's true. And look, this shooting percentage may be artificially high, but even at this percentage, what's he going to get? 16 goals at this pace? Like, that's right. not good enough. Right. Now, uh, going back to that percentage of unblocked shots that missed the net stat, Owen Tippett is your second worst forward on the team at 36. But he's not worst, Rachel. He's not. <laughs> But we we know based on the eye test alone oh, yeah. that he's just missing the net, right? Right. You know, I think the worst thing for Owen Tippett was the fact that he got clocked at 20-something miles an hour last year in a game because it always seems to come up in broadcasts and when people talk about it, but it's not doing him any good. It doesn't matter because all of a sudden, one-on-one, -on -one, he can't beat anybody. And, and so that's where I think shot deception is a big thing. Yes, he can get the puck. He can get it on the rush. But a lot of times he's not making the goalies move enough. Like I see he's coming down the end and he kind of just either goes short side or he's trying to put it five hole. And it's like a goalie. Yes. Sometimes you could get him five hole. Right. I've had pro players tell me like when I was goofing around playing even in a in a charity game because I stink. Hey, go five hole because you never know. Right. And, and players right. like real players shoot for that, too. Like that's something that's a strategy. If you have to choose between getting a goalie to move or go five hole, you always want him to move. Right. And I, I think that's part of the problem because he only has like two moves and teams have that figured out at they this do. point and they know what he's going to do. And I'll and give you I've... a guy, I'll give you a guy from the past who, when I first started covering him because he came up after the lockout, Jeff Carter, his first year, year and a half, he only had like two moves. But right. then he figured it out, and then all of a sudden he started scoring a lot. Tippett's well into this now, and he still hasn't figured it out. Yeah, and the interesting thing, I think, is that he has turned to becoming more physical than yeah. he was last year. I think as an antidote to some of this and some frustration. Or just to get ice time, yeah. Right, and it's not that he's bad at being physical. He's actually been pretty solid. Like, he can yeah. throw a hit pretty sure. well. So, you know, I don't have any complaints about how he's doing it. It's just the fact that it feels like because he's missing the net or, you know, hitting the goalie on his shot attempts and just hasn't been able to punch it through as much as you would like, you know, again, only four goals so far this season in 22 games. I think that maybe he's like focusing in the wrong area to some degree. Yeah, that's why I think a day off is good for him. I do think he needs to refocus. I think there is something to that. And and I think that might be good for him because he's just carrying too much. Yeah. So Joel Farabee is the other elephant in the room here, yeah. right? And that's why there's been some trade rumors around him so far this season. Again, you know, much lower time on ice this season than he had last season. Only three goals. So far, a very similar low shooting percentage like Owen Tippett has um, only averaging two shots on goal per game, three shot attempts per game. So, you know, I, I mean, there is some positive there in the sense that if you look at that percentage of unblocked shots that miss the net, he's actually the second best on the team. So when he's actually shooting, He's getting some quality shots, but he's just not getting enough opportunities to take those shots. No. Um, yeah, the, the shots on goal is really low. Uh, yep. That is definitely hurting him. The giveaways are worse than yep. last year already almost. Yep. 
And He's at a negative 13 in terms of giveaways versus takeaways. And and that's pretty early in the season to be at a negative 13. Already. It's really early in the season. And then, you know, is he even getting any power play time? Like, you know, he has, what, two power play assists and no power play goals. You know, my guess is it's not much time because he's only getting 1458 a game anyhow. So his power play time has got to be like 20 something seconds or less because he's not. Yeah, I mean, he was on power play, too, in the game. Yeah. against Vegas. So right? as so an example, as an example, time. they kept power play one on so long. We were watching Travis Connecty get oh, they burned did. out on it. And so like, that, the eye <laughs> test saw that. So like what kind of so these are things that are definitely going to affect his game. Now, I'm not letting that be an excuse because he's had other issues. All I'm going to tell you is this. They need to figure it out with Joel Farabee because I think if you remember um, when Claude Giroux left, they were asking him, who do you think is going to be really good? And he said Farabee. If you traded Farabee to Ottawa and he played on the same power play as Joel Farabee, like as Claude Giroux rather, you would see a big uptick in his points. Like you just would. I think so. And so there is, to me, there's something to that. And that's what you have to try and get back, even if he's on power play too. But again, he is just so out of sync right now. And I do yeah. think the torch system has kind of brought him out of sync because I think he's tried to please the coach and it's well, not because, really his game. Right. I mean, understandably, because he's been sat and right. he's been admonished. So why wouldn't he do that? Right. But, it's how you divide up. Like, I just look at it like this. Obviously, the Flyers could score more goals. Right. But then they would give up more goals. And the coach doesn't want to give up more goals. So he wants to score more goals without giving up as many. And. Not everybody you have on the team is good at that. And not everybody is going to learn that. And I do think that's a problem with the Flyers this year. I think it's a big problem because, again, it's definitely affecting some guys' offense. I'm not going to say it's affecting all three of these guys. But, listen, Tyson Forster is playing a really good two-way game. Is that unplugging probably some of his offense? Yeah, I think it probably is. Tippett, I think it's just the same Tippett. He's going to miss. He's going to miss until he figures it out. But Faraby, I do think having to put mo- so much emphasis that it's fouled up his game completely. He's not better defensively. He's not better offensively. I don't know what he is right now. Well, we'll see if any of them uh, score some goals against. They Matt, will because though. we're talking about them. Like that's a hockey. Work. I hope so. Honestly, I hope it works. I'm like knocking on wood right here. <laughs> right. All right. Uh, we will get to that preview of the game against Nashville coming up. Here's the thing. We earn points on groceries, travel, and practically everything else we buy. But we should also be earning points on rent, one of our biggest monthly expenses. Built changed the game by letting renters earn high-value points on rent and and around their neighborhood. There's no cost to join Built. As a member, you'll earn valuable points on rent and on your everyday spending. Built can be transferred to your favorite hotels, airlines, and even the ones you haven't heard of. There are over 500 airlines and 700,000 hotels and properties around the world you can redeem your Built points towards. Points can be redeemed, also be redeemed towards a future rent payment and unique experiences that only Built members can access. So if you're not earning points on rent, my question is, why not? Start earning points by renting right now. And when you go to join built.com slash locked on, that's join built.com slash locked on NHL. Make sure to use our URL so they know we sent you. Join built.com slash locked on NHL to start earning points with your rent payments today. Some of the best events take place around the holidays, and there are so many of them to choose from. Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets to your favorite live events even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. My favorite part of the Game Time app is that it's great for getting notified about last minute flash deals and super deals so you know you're getting the best bang for your buck. Best of all, they have all in pricing so there's no surprise fees at checkout when you activate the feature and your tickets are set directly to your phone so you never have to dig through email. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem with the code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. On tomorrow's show, we will uh, recap this game we're about to preview against Nashville. Plus, we're going to talk about the Flyers. A Black Friday game history because we know we've got one coming up against the Rangers on Friday. So we're going to preview that matchup as well. 
And uh, so we are going to have a Thursday show on Thanksgiving while y'all are having a good time with your turkey. And then on Friday, we'll be back again after the Flyers Rangers game. Uh, so I can't go shopping. You're, you're basically killing my Black Friday shopping. Sure. That, Thank, that's the thanks, plan. Rachel. Appreciate it. No problem. No problem. Love that Flyers Rangers Black Friday. Match it's always there. fun. So the Nashville Predators, uh, I think, you know, one of the more interesting stories here is the fact that they have been not great so far this season. They're 7-12-3 and three thus far. Uh, and it kind of leads to the question, is head coach Andrew Brunette on the hot seat right now? Uh, I don't think so. I think they have an inexperienced GM in Barry Trotz. Yep. He is. He's inexperienced. It's just, that's a fact. And I think... Last year, he kind of played it tough uh, with guys, and that's fine. And then this year, he was kind of like, all right, we're going to kind of go all in and just push the Preds, you know, into a high playoff spot. And my feeling was, hey, you might make the playoffs, but I think they were a bubble team. Now, I have always made the assertion that goal scorers go to die there. And now we're looking at Steven mm -hmm. Stamkos, and he's going to die there. Like, he's not scoring oh, like God. he used to. I don't know if it's the hot chicken. I don't know what it is. But something in that area makes guys not score goals or that system or something. And it's really bad. Like, it's just they don't score goals. And the other thing that is hurting them, and I forget who pointed it out, but it's been noticeable the last, I'd say, five years. Their first-round draft picks are flaming out. And they're yeah. not getting, you know, and they just traded Philip Tomasino. Correct. Yeah, they just traded him to Pittsburgh right. for a fourth round pick. Like I mean, three this years is down the road, killing the organization. Yeah. So that's another thing. But again, other than Philip Forsberg, and I've been saying this for as long as I've been on the show, very few other guys score goals. Illy Tovin and left, he scored goals. While he was there, he didn't score goals. <laughs> yeah, it's remarkable how poor their development process has yeah, been, it's and bad. that's. That's a huge thing that they have to get under control. And they've really only been able to get success and high scores via trade. Right. right. And so that's something that they have to improve. They are one of the teams up for David Yerichek, should right. that happen uh, right now. But they've had an interesting recent streak because uh, while the Flyers were playing Vegas, they faced the New Jersey Devils. They lost five to two in that game. Uh, Nico Heischer had his first career hat trick in that game. The Devils, and like we said, the Devils are one team to watch out for, and they schooled them, man. They did. Uh, you say Saros was pulled in that game after the fourth Jersey Devils goal in that one. It was not a good game. And it was especially disappointing for Nashville because they literally had just won against the high flying Winnipeg Jets uh, and they won four to one in a decisive game. So and we have to say maybe that could was Winnipeg. not keep it going. Yeah, I would say that's just Winnipeg due to get a loss just because of the way they were so yep. hot and still really are probably law of averages, not because of, you know, any great play. Totally, because the Preds lost to the Kraken three to nothing. Um, they did win against the Canucks five to three. The Canucks are kind of in a weird They're spot in a right bit now. Of a malaise too, yeah. Yeah, so it, it's just been a bizarre season thus far for Nashville, right? Yeah, it's hard. And, you know, they're look, I all I have to do is we used to marvel at, at their defense. And now I'm looking at, you know, Luke Shen in there, Marco Del Gaizo, mm -hmm. who I watched in college, and he's okay. Like, he's okay. But that third pairing is definitely a problem. And then you look at the second pairing, it's like Brady Shea and Carrier. Okay, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Jeremy Lawson should never be a top pairing guy. I mean, I like him. Yeah. Let's let's be real here. I know. I mean, like Yossi is really the only yeah, Yossi's standout the great defenseman Yossi is, there, right? Yeah, he's always tremendous. So it's really interesting because, you know, the, the Preds do have some overall better team stats than the Flyers, but sure. the Flyers are doing better record wise thus far and it could be a divisional thing but again you know the flyers have been playing all different divisions it hasn't really settled into you know the patterns this season there but you know the preds are better at face-offs the flyers spend a lot more time in their defensive zone than the preds do and obviously vice versa for the offensive zone the preds power play is 12th in the nhl the flyers are 24th the Preds penalty kill is the best in the NHL. 
um, you know, one of the few couple of teams that are better than the That's Flyers. That's what lets them win some kill. games. It probably really right. helps. It bails them out. Well, and that means that the Flyers really have to focus on scoring goals at even strength because the Preds penalty kill is going to be really tough. I mean, one could against. say the Flyers power play hurt their last game because if they'd have scored a one power play goal, it could have made a difference. But, <laughs> you know, this will be another one where like, yeah, if you get two chances, you need to score on one of those power plays. Yeah, I. well, but that's the thing. It's like if you can't, then you got to focus on the five on five. You do. You do. I, look, the Preds aren't a horrible team. They're not. So they're going to play no. this one tough and close to the vest. Saros is going to want to bounce back. There's no question, although I am not a big fan of Saros. You know that. I say just right. keep shooting high and you'll eventually get him. Uh, and from far away. So if you shoot high and far away, sometimes he doesn't come out and get the angle as well as I would like. Uh, but that's just me. Maybe that's just my bias. But I would do that. But you can't let this game stay close. Because if you let this game stay close, then you have guys like Stamkos and such and Forsberg that can do enough to kind of sting you in the end. You know what I mean? So. My feeling is now again, I don't know if a three nothing lead's a good thing, but <laughs> well, it's the worst lead in hockey. Like it's not, you know, that's just the fact. We all have talked about it. Everybody had there's probably a meme for it out there. But my my feeling is don't now Nashville isn't going to be a team that could sit on a lead anymore either, but just don't let them stay close enough where they could sting you. Don't let this be a one one right. game, you know, middle of the third. That's Correct. what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's huge. And I would say that in terms of defensive strategy, the Preds are their bread and butter is net front. Right. Most of their goals are net front. And that is the case for most teams, but a higher concentration of them are net front so far this season. You know, Flyers have double the high slot goals than the Preds do this season. And we and we complain about it. So just imagine if we were like on locked on Preds. Oh boy, that's a tough job. Oh man, I know feel bad for them but uh yeah it's going to be an interesting matchup a physical matchup i think you know take a lot of shots on goal and from everywhere in every circumstance just keep shooting and i think that's the best strategy yeah i mean philip forsberg having 17 points in 22 games is a miracle yeah absolutely <laughs> all right well there are a lot of questions in nashville y'all have a lot of questions for us about the flyers we're going to get to them coming up next get ready to tackle the nfl action with fanduel america's number one sports book because right now new customers can bet five dollars and get 150 in bonus bets if you win the fanduel sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the nfl all in one place so when you get a hunch in the middle of the game you can check out the latest stats view live play by play and so much more on the same page where you place your bets I, again, I would take the Green Bay Packers over the Miami Dolphins because the Dolphins don't like cold weather. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today. You'll start. You'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com. Never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. All right. There are a lot of questions about Matvey Mitchkoff. We are going to get to some of them today and I'm going to start with fancy friends, three eleven, who we've answered their question before, but this is like a good comment in response to our uh, wrap up of the Vegas game. I'm a little surprised you didn't mention Mitch Kopp tonight. We all know he's been good on the power play and over time when he has open ice, but five on five, he tends to disappear. Kind of true. Not only did he score at five on five, but it was the first game I can remember. He was really noticeable in every period, showed up winning puck battles, making plays. I thought it was a nice step in his five on five game. And I would say, yes, this is absolutely true there. I think there were just bigger fish to fry. In That's this all game. it was. There was just so many things to talk about. We knew we could do an entire other show about it. Yeah, I think you see he's starting to um, produce more on the details end. Uh, in that game, he definitely uh, made a few defensive plays that you didn't see yeah. earlier in the year. So, yeah, that, that's all that's true, and that's all a good sign for him. It hasn't really earned him more five-on-five -five ice time yet, though. And right. I do think that's something that has to be adjusted at some point. Right. He only had one giveaway in the whole game. Yeah. And that's definitely an improvement it there. Is. Uh, three scoring chances for and that one goal at five on five. So it's an excellent point. 
And yep. yeah, uh, love to talk about every player, every game. But yeah, it's just hard. We gotta. But hey, this is good to get it in the mailbag, so you, we yep. do talk about it. Uh, Joel um, emailed us and said, "Do you think that Matt Vaymichkov has a chance to beat Flyers rookie record in points currently held by Michael Redberg? Rennie had an incredible year next to Lindros and Recky, so I guess it would be tough. But uh, Mitchkov is the most talented guy I've ever seen in a Flyers uniform." Yeah, I don't think he'll get it because it's a different era. I think it's going to be harder, and and the coach he has. Uh, if he were playing in San Jose and didn't have to do as much defensively, like let's say Celebrini, uh, he would have more points. So I do think, and and again, we just talked about his limited five-on-five five ice right. time. That is going to affect him too. Even though the Flyers have played the most overtime games and he has overtime goals, you can't count on that. Uh, as far as in the rookie race. So I do think he's going to miss out on their record, but he's going to be a, you know, Calder finalist. I'm pretty sure of that unless something unforeseen happens. Yeah. So he's got 17 points right now. Michael Remberg had 82 points. Yeah. That's, that's going to be a tough, tough. That's a tough task. Not to say he couldn't get hot at some point, but that's really. Yeah. Could he squeak into the top five? You know, the lowest of the top five is Ron Flockhart at 72 points. Maybe. That's, that's even a, a long, stretch. That's a tough one too, though. Yeah, yeah, but I, I do think he's going to have a very successful season and be a Calder finalist. You know, unless something crazy happens. But yep. um, a lot of good stuff with him. Uh, David Vaughn asks, "Why can't you use Frost on the PK if Travis Konechny can do it? So can he? Because he's just not given a chance. Of course, he can. He could learn it. He has very similar. He." In a way, there's a lot that Travis Konechny does that Frost can do, but Frost has never been given that opportunity, just like Konechny wasn't given that opportunity until Torts was here, right? So it's almost the same story. Yeah, I do think he could do it. And then would he be more of a weapon? Sure, because with what he can do in open ice, uh, if he were able to make a block or so and then get the puck on his stick, he could be real dangerous, but he's not going to get that chance with, with this coach. Yeah, it's interesting because Sean Couturier sometimes gets those overtime starts, right? Where he'll yes. take the face off, win it, dish it to Konechny, and then get off the ice and a different and a winger will Correct. come on, right? Yep. And with Frost, you would almost expect him to stay on the ice and not do of that. Course. And I, yeah. and that's like so it's kind of not what the Flyers have been doing. So I I think it's partially situational and partially yeah. a trust factor. Yeah, I coaches. think that's true. Deacon Frost nine, a little frost in the in the name there. I hope Danny goes after David Yurichek. At this point, there's nothing to lose. Comcast can pay for a nicer place for him in Cherry Hill anyway. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I mean he'll he'll sell the place in Columbus. He'll get a place in Cherry Hill. That's an upgrade, no question about it. Uh, look, I think they should definitely do it. We know that they're in on it. There are there's at least four or five other teams from what we hear from Elliot Friedman and other insiders. So it's just a matter of who in the end gives the best offer or what player intrigues Columbus the most. It's going to, you know, so yeah, they're in on it. So that's all they can do. They're trying. Yeah, I, I think so. And, you know, we'll see. I don't know if there's like a winner here in this sort of sweepstake. It's just a trade in my opinion. Right. But, um, you know, the pens were added to the rumor mill as of a couple of days ago as well. So we do have to add this. We'll see if Don Waddell can get the same value and trade him out of division. He's going to do that first. So that's, you know, so that's something where that holds the Flyers and the Penguins back a little bit. Now, if everything's equal, then they have a real shot. Correct. Correct. So just depends on what Danny's willing to offer, I think. Yeah. Last question. Brett wants to know at this point in the season, what's the difference if the Flyers end up just missing the playoffs again or falling way down the standings as far as progression versus draft picks? Okay. So the Flyers spent the last couple of years loading up on this draft. And I have my first list out. It's on NHLDraftBuzz.com. I talk to other draft people, like, you know, and so far, this draft is not super impressive. So if you want these two first round picks to be guaranteed picks and maybe one of them be a franchise player, don't end up like 13th overall. Like if 13th overall is your first pick, you're doing it wrong. And I'm sorry. I mean, and if that means that at some point you got to pull the plug on the season to do this, it's in their best interest to do it because you you could look every team 
is bunched up in this league, but there's a there's a middle there in in the East. There's a big mushy middle, and if they get stuck in it this time and they're not high up, like to me, if I'm the Flyers, I want to be in that top five, and I may not be able to trade into the top five, especially if other teams feel like after the top ten, there's there's quite a bit of drop off. If they could get two picks in the top ten, that is a massive massive advantage. Right. And I think that, you know, right now, if you look at if the standings stay the same as they are now, the Flyers would have the 11th pick overall. And then the 16th pick is the Edmonton pick, which is conditional. And then right. the Avalanche pick is 17. So 11, 16, 17 isn't going to get you a franchise player. Probably that's not. for sure. But I, I do think that, you know, you still just play it out. And you try to win every game you can and see yeah, where it see, comes I'm out in the differ wash. On that. I, think, I think if the numbers start getting bad in the next couple of weeks, that's when the GM should step in and, and maybe do some things to make sure that they have a better draft position. That still doesn't mean they shouldn't try and win games, but a GM can can definitely affect things. And sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes Because again, 11, 16, 17, it's not bad. But you may just get a really, really good player and some good players instead of getting another great player. You need another great player to play with Michkov in the future. That's what you have to get. Right. And that's where I think you kind of have to wait this out until trade deadline and then see what you want to do with, with those assets and with the players you have. And yeah. And it may be, that may be the time and that's, that's fine. And I'm not pushing Jet Luchenko out saying he can't be that guy, but I'm just saying that's not even enough any anymore. Just look at the Avalanche as an example. When they played a few weeks ago, how many of those guys were high picks? You need those guys. Yep, absolutely. All right, that will do it for today's show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back tomorrow to break down the Flyers versus Preds game, talk Flyers Black Friday game history, and preview the matchup against the Rangers. As a reminder, we always want to hear from you. If you want your question answered on the show like we just did today, let us know on any of our socials at Locked on Flyers. You can email us at Locked on Flyers at Gmail or comment on our YouTube channel. I'm Rachel. I'm on Blue Sky and Twitter at our Miriam. That's our M-I-R-I-A-M. I'm Russ. I'm on those same socials at Sportsology, S-P-O-R-T-S-O-L-O-G-Y. Thanks for making Locked On Flyers your first listen today. For your second listen, find Locked On Fantasy Hockey. Become a fantasy hockey expert. Get the edge over your league mates with daily tips from Steel and Flip. Find Locked On Fantasy Hockey on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. Have a great day.